covers and the backing up um, is problematic. <clears throat> Uh, in uh, the mining industry, which, as I, I said, was uh, where a lot of my research uh, started and, and still exists, um, LHDs and haul trucks accounting for 16 and 9 percent of underground fatalities. That's some U.S. data. Uh, similar uh, statistics uh, would uh, be found for uh, Canada as well as across uh, the world. Uh, so we know that uh, the, the machines, specifically the LHDs, the load haul dumps in which the operator is sitting perpendicular to the line of travel and, and, and you know, operates both equally forwards uh, and backwards, uh, accounts for uh, a lot of fatalities. And, and a lot of this is resulting from limited line of sight from that machinery. Um, and there's a requirement for the operators to get into some very awkward postures uh, to achieve any sort of line of sight. And so they are with ex uh, extreme rotation in the trunk uh, and the neck. Uh, to look both to the right and to the left, depending on whether they're driving forwards or backwards. Um, <clears throat> we know that when we get into some of the surface mining applications as well, where they're using very large haul trucks, uh, that that machinery that you see on the right-hand side of the screen there um, has also uh, been involved with uh, several uh, accidents and fatalities, again, due to the, the massive uh, size of it and uh, hitting other smaller items in the workplace. <clears throat> Uh, so on uh, construction, oh. <clears throat> are we good? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so Canadian legislation uh, dictates, uh, specifically on construction sites, that um, first of all, machinery should have reversing alarms, and secondly, they should have spotters uh, when they are uh, operating in reverse. However, uh, in a uh, study looking at U.S. fatalities, in, in 56 out of 69 cases, the backup alarm was disabled. And if you've spent time um, in a construction site or other workplaces, you know that that constant uh, beeping uh, noise can get um, very annoying. And so a lot of times those things get turned off uh, just uh, as a result of, of the annoyance factor. <clears throat> in 2014, uh, two Ontario workers died when they were struck by equipment they were directing at the time. So that's a case where spotters were being used. Uh, however, whether it was a miscommunication or uh, the operator not understanding uh, where that spotter was supposed to be at the time. Um, so we're seeing like there's some, some issues uh, there, even with the existing uh, safety factors that are, have been implemented. So what doesn't an operator see? And a lot of uh, my initial work sort of was around this idea of what, what can't be seen from the operator's position. And the pictures that you're looking at on the screen right now are from uh, that underground mining machinery, the LHD. Uh, and on the left, uh, you can see that there is a pedestrian um, out uh, in front, um, and their reflective clothing uh, is, is highlighted. But as soon as that machinery moves a few feet forward, uh, we can see that that pedestrian location is now obscured or obstructed uh, by some part of the machinery, in this case, um, you know, either the, the extending cylinder or the light bracket. And so uh, you can get a feel for how limited line of sight is in the underground environment. Um, on surface and on construction sites, uh, depending on uh, what you're operating. Um, you said to click it here. <laughs> click it here, okay. Yeah, I'm used to just you know, click wherever I want to. Uh, so the, the cab structures certainly provide uh, some, some limited line of sight for, for operators. As well, when you're above ground, uh, you might be working in a very cluttered work site with a lot of uh, things happening. It might be a fairly open work site where there's uh, other workers moving through, where there might be pedestrians moving through. And so it's not quite as uh, a closed scenario as you might find underground. Uh, machine design does play a role. So you can see uh, the, the view for a lift truck or a, a forklift operator on the right. Um, and it, it's quite uh, restricted in terms of forward function. If that operator was operating in reverse, uh, there would still be machinery uh, components obstructing their view, but they also have to get into, again, another twisted uh, position in order to look behind them and, and operate in reverse. Um, and if you start uh, looking at some of this construction uh, machinery, you'll see that multiple mirrors uh, have been started to add to the machine in an attempt to increase uh, line of sight and improve uh, vision to the, to the front and to the back. Okay, let's see if I can answer it here. Good. 
good. Uh, so ways that we can evaluate uh, line of sight, and uh, often we will go to the ISO 5006 standard, uh, which tests the operator's field of view on earth moving of machinery. Um, and it's got a very uh, specific method where the machinery has to be in the center of this 12 meter boundary uh, that you can see, and then you test for maskings at that uh, fairly large uh, distance. Uh, we've replicated this particular method in a computer simulation environment, and you can see that uh, in this case, the green indicates a line of sight uh, on that 12 meter test circle, um, and the red indicates no line of sight, and then you can, uh, evaluate those in terms of whether they exceeded the maximum uh, width that's allowed for a particular machinery. Um, the actual machinery listed in earth moving machinery uh, standard isn't always, uh, doesn't always match what you're, what you're evaluating, um, so there, there can be some limits in terms of uh, applicability there. The ISO also uses um, masking widths on this one meter perimeter, so this is measured at a vertical height of 1.5 meters at a one meter um, perimeter around the machine. Um, and so you can see this particular uh, machine that was, um, <clears throat> sorry, a, that was uh, evaluated has significant uh, blocks and would certainly benefit from some sort of reversing um, technology added to it. Uh, you've probably seen this type of plot before, and this is some of the original work that we did in the mining industry uh, for, for line of sight. And so the white box in the middle is the, the load haul dump, the LHD, and then we have uh, circles around that blue, green, and red, and uh, the red is indicating that the roadway is not visible to the operator at those uh, significant distances out from the machinery. Um, and so a blue 1.7 uh, meter tall pedestrian would still uh, just uh, not be visible to the operator. Uh, and you can see that you're still getting you know, 10 meters uh, out to the back and you know, 10 meters off to the front right uh, corner of that LHD, even for a standing uh, operator who's 1.7 meters tall. The gray uh, rays that you see in this picture indicate complete blind spots, uh, typically resulting from machine uh, parts, so the cab structure, uh, as well as other uh, imposing uh, pieces of machinery that would block uh, visibility. So we know that uh, line of sight is quite limited for operators of the, of the LHD. Um, when we got into a computer environment, we started producing these box plots, as we, as we like to call them. Um, and then we could uh, personalize or, or customize, uh, for instance, uh, the different distances that you might be interested in. And so we have sort of a one meter perimeter right around the machinery. We also have a stopping distance and then perhaps um, a longer uh, evaluation grid. And anytime you see these uh, plots, again, red equals not visible and green um, indicates that the, uh, that area is visible to the operator at that point in time. Here's another uh, large piece of machinery uh, that would be found underground. Um, this is a large uh, electric uh, haul truck, and you can see that the machine is quite large, um, but it also has huge blind spots. That's the black that you're looking at in this particular picture. The yellow indicates the, uh, the machinery that we were evaluating at that point. Uh, the blue is sort of the test grid that we were working on, and green plot in this case again indicates uh, a, a standing uh, pedestrian would not be visible at that uh, distance, uh, but the black indicates those total blind spots. So this was a a piece of machinery that was, uh, again, going to be a, a good candidate for some sort of uh, technology that was going to improve uh, line of sight for the operator. Now, inside our simulation environment, uh, we also have the capacity to do a little bit of animation work. And <clears throat> you can see on the screen now, I hope it's uh, moving, it looks like it is. Uh, so this is a, a lift truck. Um, small um, manual materials handling type of machinery used in lots of different manufacturing and uh, industrial situations. And so it's backing up uh, in that small room and then moving into position. And you can see that there is a, another pedestrian in the environment. There's some obstacles uh, that would need to be avoided. Uh, and so the nice thing about our simulation program is that we can then uh, bring up 
a view uh, of what the operator is seeing at that point in time. Um, so I've got two views on the screen now. The left shows uh, the human operating that lift truck and they don't have a load on the front of their forks. Uh, the picture on the right, a um, little bit uh, different view. They're looking, uh, the, the head position of the operator would be uh, tilted up somewhat. And you can see that they've now loaded one of those barrels in the environment onto the front of their uh, lift. So um, I'll play this one first. And you can see that quite quickly that pedestrian uh, was blocked by one of the masts. And that's in the scenario where there's no load on the front of that machine. And then driving forward, um, the, the operator still has these, these large blocks in their uh, perimeter in terms of what they're trying to be able to see. Um, on the right hand side, now this is when um, the forklift is loaded and you just put that barrel on top of there and you can see that uh, that's going to significantly affect uh, line of sight as well and being able to maneuver safely um, in the workplace. And so a little bit later, I'll come back to that video and we're going to show the uh, effect of adding a, a camera in that particular situation. Now the uh, plots that you can see on the screen uh, were done by uh, the Division of Safety Research uh, out of NIOSH. And uh, that's an excellent resource. They have all sorts of construction machinery and they've done uh, these large um, plots based on the 12 meter radius circle as stated in the ISO standard. Uh, they have them for all sorts of machinery and also different sizes of machinery as well. Uh, and you can see that the gray in this situation indicates a blind area to the operator. And they've also been able to add in uh, any additional visibility that is achieved by putting mirrors on the machinery. Now mirrors often get added sort of as a retrofit and so it might not be uh, standard across all types of machinery depending on what situation you're in. Uh, but for this particular piece of equipment they had um, both convex and flat mirrors adding to the visibility. Uh, and so I uh, just wanted to mention that as an excellent resource if you're looking uh, to understand how much blind spot a particular piece of construction equipment would have. Um, you should check out uh, that resource. Uh, we used this in a study uh, with construction workers. And so the, the stars that you see on that screen have been added um, as part of the, the research that we did. And so we gave uh, the participants um, a picture of that 12 meter radius circle with the machinery in the middle and the sectors were outlined as well. We didn't have the blind spots added. So that was that was part of the, the rating that they did. So they didn't see what the actual blind area was. We just asked them to rate those sectors. Uh, and then we asked them to indicate with a star where they would position themselves if they were trying to uh, be a spotter or a flag person, whatever you want to call that uh, term, a uh, signaler to help back that machine up. And so the stars uh, indicate their answers to those, that question. Uh, so you can you can look at where people would position themselves if they were trying to help that piece of machinery back up in the workplace. Uh, and I suppose at least for the haul truck, which is the picture on the left, uh, everyone is in a what would be a blind spot to the operator, but you can see that they do position themselves where there would be mirror visibility. So that uh, makes sense. Uh, the, the picture on the right is an excavator um, and a little bit different results there. So you can see that, and of course it would depend on where the mirrors were specifically focused for that. Um, but we in fact have people positioning themselves in front of the machinery. Uh, we have people positioning themselves in the back in areas that would not be 100% uh, visible to the operator at that point. Um, although there is uh, some mirror visibility. So hopefully uh, there will be some communication in terms of when they were into the mirror area versus not. Um, so we thought that was uh, an interesting way to display people's understanding and knowledge of, of blind spot areas uh, around uh, machinery. Now this is just a subset of, of some of that data. Um, again, we asked them to rate um, how good the visibility was in each of those sectors. And we expressed that as a, as a percentage of that total area. 
and uh, and then we compared it to the actual what we would consider the gold standard value. So we quantified that gray area in, in terms of how much was it was it covering. Um, so in the red areas that you see on the screen, which is most of the sectors, um, users were rating those areas as having better visibility than it actually has. So they might have given those areas a three out of five rating for visibility, um, when in fact 100% is blocked to the operator completely. Um, and in, in the green area, that's the user is basically rating the area as having um, poorer visibility than it actually has. Um, and that's only on the one left side of the machine there. So typically, um, it was the other scenario. So that's some research that we're just working on compiling uh, moving forward. So we know that technology uh, has the capacity to improve situational awareness in these in, in, uh, in all these industries, construction, uh, mining, uh, warehousing. Um, and we also know that it ha that has the potential to increase the rates of distracted driving. So we know that uh, distracted driving is prevalent in passenger vehicles for sure. Uh, and as we add more technology into that situation, um, the distracted driving increases, but it, it can give information to the operator that, that can help them um, respond to stimuli in their environment um, and so we just need to make sure that whatever we add to the, to the machinery uh, to help the operator is that they're able to mentally manage sort of the competing demands uh, that are coming at them in, in the machine. Um, and so broadly, uh, these devices might be considered proximity detection technologies. There's lots of different terms there. Um, but we can look at uh, many different aspects uh, of the ergonomics or the human factors of these technologies. And uh, so we can think about uh, combining alarm technologies. So we know that you can have sort of visual input, you can have audio input. Uh, we know that the amount of information being presented at a time can impact some of those mental demands on the operator. Uh, the location of the information coming in is a, is a huge ergonomic concern. There's a Sometimes there's a, a lot of real estate inside the cab and on the window area. Other times there's not much room at all for placing the actual information device for the operator. Uh, we know that the impact of what the information looks like, so the coding, uh, is going to play a role as well. And then how often the operator has to interact with that device and whether, as you can see on the screen, whether um, the operator needing to touch that screen is going to, again, change uh, the requirements of their driving tasks. So, these are all factors that have been researched uh, fairly well in passenger vehicles, and we are seeing that technology being implemented. Uh, the amount of research on the industrial side is not nowhere near the same level, and we certainly can't uh, take a solution that works for passenger vehicles driving above the ground and then uh, port it over to uh, either underground mining or other industrial uh, scenarios without doing some extensive research uh, on it in these contexts. Uh, so when it comes to choosing a, a technology, there are a variety that have been tested over the years. You can see them listed on the screen there. Um, obviously, some of them have downfalls depending on what environment you're in. So uh, you know, the closed circuit television camera got a lot of uh, criticism early on because the cameras would get dirty fairly quickly, in, in especially in underground environment, but other industrial areas. Uh, GPS obviously does not work um, underground. Um, and then we have, you know, we're going to group the rest of those, the RFID, the EMF uh, sources, the radar, the sonar, and the infrared have uh, all been tested in a, in a variety of situations. Um, and the, the technology, the reliability of these things is improving. So there is uh, work, again, out of NIOSH where they evaluate sort of the reliable detection zones for these uh, different types of systems. And so the technology has advanced significantly. So the actual ability to detect something in those zones is good. And it's getting even better with uh, the, the combination of using several of those technologies at once. Um, so some of them are better at lar uh, long range identification and some of them are better at short range. So Combining them uh, is, is useful. As you can see, this and these are all uh, scans out of the, that NIOSH article. So we know that combining um, those multiple technologies 
uh, is going to lead to a fairly uh, robust system with very uh, few false alarms. Um, and I think that the, the technology has come a long way uh, in the last little bit. Mounting considerations are still problematic, obviously on this large machinery, um, to be able to choose the number of cameras or other technology that you need around there uh, in order to maximize sort of the zone that you're able to, to reliably detect uh, someone in. Uh, and oh, I had another thought there and I think it's gone. All right, so for a good uh, review on, on, on proximity warning technologies, uh, you can look uh, in the literature. There are several who have tried to sort of evaluate all of these uh, devices. So you can see this uh, particular chart is evaluating sonar systems, uh, radar systems, the uh, magnetic or field tag based systems, and then the radio frequency identification. Uh, systems. Uh, oh, and so some of those also depend on, on tagging everything else in the environment. So the the way you get to sort of more coverage and, and better coverage um, is by, if you're using RFID, you really need to tag everything that might be of interest um, to the system in order to be able to pick it up. So if you, for instance, one day wanted to tag um, a hole that had uh, opened up underground and you didn't want anyone going around it, you would have to add the technology to that zone in order for the machinery to then detect it and, and want to avoid it. Um, so uh, lots of work being done to try and uh, determine, you know, what you can see on the left-hand side there, um, what's the relative frequency of false alarms um, or nuisance alarms? Uh, what is the tolerance of that particular technology to mud, dust, dirt buildup? Uh, what's the installation and setup like? Um, and then we've got some cost evaluations as well. In terms of so that was uh, mostly uh, based on underground uh, systems. Um, this particular chart here uh, was done more for uh, surface uh, haul trucks. And uh, you can see that they've evaluated uh, six or seven very specific uh, companies who are producing uh, devices for above ground uh, applications. And some of the same things are, are of interest to uh, people potentially purchasing uh, these things in terms of maximum length of a front detection zone, um, how, what kind of uh, resistance to weather uh, do these things have. Uh, again, false alarm rates become interesting, and I'm going to talk about that in a couple of slides from now. Um, how many units you need, and uh, cost obviously comes into play with all of these devices. <clears throat> so what are some of the different ways that we can increase uh, situation uh, awareness for the operator? And just broadly, I've uh, tried to group what some of these um, things are using in terms of information. Um, so we, we've got video feeds, so that's just a simple uh, camera system on the top. Uh, some systems also introduce you know, text information uh, into their informational display. Uh, some systems revert to more symbolic or or icons in order to alert the operator that there might be something in the environment that they need to pay attention to. Uh, we've got audio audio signals or audio visual signals combined. Um, so audio uh, does lend itself to, as we've seen, that, that nuisance uh, effect. There's too many uh, beeps and buzzes going off in your environment. There is a tendency uh, for you to try to turn them off or circumvent them in some way. Um, just combining audiovisual uh, can be a useful tactic. Uh, and then uh, the vibrotactile uh, research is also out there. So that's um, that buzzing feeling that you get off of your smartphone. And uh, there's quite a bit of uh, research out there um, on, on that particular uh, mode of alerting the operator in terms of what they need to pay attention to. So the major requirement um, in any of these display-based uh, information systems is that you need to have rapid and reliable transmission of very easily understandable information. That's going to uh, become critical for that piece where we're increasing situation awareness without having a negative impact on, on um, the mental and cognitive demands of the operator. Um, I've alluded to the fact uh, that placement within the cab uh, might be important. Um, well, it definitely is important. 
Uh, and then if we project forward, uh, recognizing that heads up display technology will be sort of the next uh, development in this area. Uh, and knowing that once something uh, moves into a heads up display sort of feature, everything that we sort of knew and decided about uh, optimal placement um, or optimal presentation of information might change again when we get to that heads up uh, display uh, point of our, of our lives. <clears throat> Now, this is some research out of uh, Australia, and so uh, Tim Horbury has um, sort of very wisely put together these, these uh, guidelines for what implemented technology should do. So it, it needs to address um, a safety problem. Uh, it's, we don't want to be driving towards these systems uh, based on maybe a production uh, or an efficiency perspective, because certainly um, all of the systems out there also have that capacity, uh, but we want to think about how uh, or the capacity to, to uh, address uh, the safety issue uh, of you know, accidents and fatalities. Um, we don't want the technology to require overly extensive retrofitting. Uh, at the moment, that's what most of the systems are doing. Uh, basically, they are being put, in, put into the uh, equipment after the fact. Um, and so it's, it's, it's harder to integrate a really uh, perfect solution when you're hanging on to um, an already existing uh, system. Um, you want to uh, not be likely to face strong opposition from all users. So this, as with any uh, ergonomic implementation, uh, you want uh, buy-in from the people who are using it. And I, I've always uh, added on there that um, policy and procedure are almost as important as the intervention themselves. Um, so just adding uh, a proximity detection system into an existing situation likely won't be super successful unless there's a corresponding policy and procedure uh, that go along with it. Um, so capable of being integrated, that goes back to the second point. Um, have no competing low technology countermeasure that is doing the same thing. Um, so not trying to, uh, you know, replicate all efforts that are already there. Um, so it needs to be um, fully implemented and integrated solution. Um, and then be reliable and produce very few alarms. And that goes back to getting buy-in uh, from the user. Uh, so a system that goes in and leads to lots of false alarms does not induce a feeling of trust within the, with the system. Um, there's a tendency for users to ignore it. So some of the key points uh, that I wanted to point out here. So I've, I've alluded to this already, the, the idea that combined alert modalities are likely uh, preferred. Um, so avoiding text-only displays uh, seems to be uh, a good recommendation. And in all, in all cases, when I'm, I'm talking about uh, this research, sometimes it's, it exists solely on sort of the passenger car uh, side of, of research, um, but when it's related to either military applications or other industrial applications, um, I've added it in here. So uh, using either icons plus text is, is better, um, or icons plus some sort of auditory alert is optimal. Um, specifically, if you're looking for uh, drawing the user's attention to accident information or the, you're about to hit something information, uh, certainly iconic or auditory is better uh, than text. Uh, coded warnings should be sort of avoided. You want to remove any inf uh, inference required by the user, so you don't want the user to have to try and interpret uh, whatever that code is that they're looking at. Um, so those definitely require more processing and they can increase the task command um, on the operator. Um, I think especially in the mining application that we've been looking at, uh, it's really important specifically because they are seated in that sort of sideways uh, orientation. And if that screen is not really in their line of view for how they drive that machine, they might just be glancing at it very quickly. So the, the ability for that information to pop up has to be very, um, very good. Uh, system trust changes driving behavior. So I think this is some interesting uh, research. So drivers with uh, high levels of trust in their system um, actually show longer 
uh, delays in the response times. So they're basically relying on the system to alert them that something's wrong um, or even to stop the machine if it's an actual collision avoidance uh, system. Um, and so in this case, the behavior really is changing for the worse. And that was, that was observed fairly early on when collision avoidance technology um, was introduced to some of this industrial machinery. Um, the operators would um, start uh, driving differently, basically faster, a little bit more uh, dangerous. They didn't have the same buffer zone around them because they knew the machine was going to stop for them um, in, a, in an accident. So uh, if we have lower trust in um, a, a system, um, we seem to see uh, no delays in, in terms of response. The braking response in particular is usually what's measured there. So operators move to brake sooner um, when they don't trust the uh, system quite as much or it doesn't have as much control over their driving uh, situation. Um, early and late alarm timing also uh, affects um, a driver's trust. Um, and so uh, these are things that we want to consider when we're designing um, a system. In-cabin location um, also uh, matters. This is from passenger vehicles. Uh, they had a rear view camera uh, added to passenger vehicles. That's pretty common in most new vehicles now. Um, and so any location would reduce crashes by up to 28% because of the, the finding there. Uh, and that was when trying to avoid uh, obstacles that were in your rear path. Um, but it depended where that thing was and they tested a few different locations. Larger wasn't necessarily better, so the bigger the screen uh, wasn't necessarily better. And the most effective location actually happened to be uh, up inside the rear view mirror. And uh, that particular display was used most often and for the longest uh, durations when they looked at some eye tracking uh, research. And so they were able to incorporate that in mirror display into their already existing gaze patterns for doing a backup maneuver. Um, so they didn't really have to change how they used their other aids, which might have been their rear view uh, mirror or their side mirror. So it just got integrated into their natural scanning pattern. So I think anything that gets implemented at an industrial level has to consider that, that natural scan pattern um, that operators um, use on a regular basis. Uh, so design considerations here, I've talked about the combined, so pairing a visual with an iconic, um, or sorry, pairing a visual with an audio and that visual really should be iconic uh, and leading away from text, uh, not using coded uh, displays. Uh, the vibro-tactile research uh, to date really done in passenger vehicle situations but hasn't even been implemented yet. Um, they've done testing on various body parts, so what body part is best at identifying hands, feet, uh, torso, head. They've done directional testing, so getting an alert on your, on your back if you're trying to avoid a rear view collision versus a, an alert or a, a vibration on your front to alert a frontward collision. Um, it significantly increases your reaction time, so you react much quicker uh, to stopping. Uh, and breaking time. The application is a little bit uh, limited uh, to date uh, because there's no consistent uh, way to add that information into the driving situation. So it might be a little while before we see that technology implemented uh, on an industrial level. <clears throat> and then standardization of icons across the industry and across the world is also uh, lacking. Uh, so if we go to, to add an icon to a situation, it needs to be understandable by users uh, regardless of where they might be operating the machinery. Uh, I've added this slide uh, and it relates to uh, an article that was published just last year uh, that more information is not always uh, better. And so the work comes from out of Australia, Burgess uh, Limerick in 2011. He was evaluating uh, US fatalities in the coal industry. And he found that in 23 cases, which was about 56%, either the operator of the equipment was the victim or the operator was aware of the position of the victim immediately prior to the accident occurring. And uh, so the question could be asked whether a technology in that case would actually uh, improve the ability to detect the pedestrian. And we mocked this up in our computer simulation uh, program, which you can see on the bottom with the red and green slides. And uh, certainly the location of the pedestrian, you can see that they're, they're across, um, uh, across cut there, and they're in another tunnel, and there's a little bit of an angle uh, to it. And really, the camera system could not detect that, that uh, person because of the uh, or design of the mine. 
Uh, it really wasn't had, didn't have to do with the limits of the camera. It had to do with the limits of the mine and where that, that person was uh, located. Um, and so it wasn't until the very last moment, um, and you can see that little sliver of green on the right-hand side picture where, um, and that's just at the stopping distance. That's a, basically the first time that the camera system is able to pick up uh, that there is a person in that location. And so certainly you can understand uh, why the statistics um, are uh, listed the way they are. Um, okay, so I, I actually don't remember why this is in here, but uh, I guess if we need to under, uh, regardless of whether we just got a simple video feed camera or whether we've got a proximity, a proximity detection monitor and an information display uh, in addition to that, um, the interface is critical to ensure uh, that the warning is identified, it's understood, and that appropriate action can be taken in time to avoid the collision. Um, and so those are some of the, the things that we need to think about as we uh, move towards integration of this technology. Um, I've done quite a bit of work that just uh, evaluates uh, the effect of a very basic camera system um, on industrial machinery. And this slide uh, highlights going from left to right sort of the added uh, line of sight that you get as you add in more cameras to the situation. Um, so the line of sight from the operator's perspective on the left is, is quite blocked. They can see mostly down their left hand or behind them, uh, the wall behind them. And so as you add in cameras uh, to that situation, you do increase line of sight. However, uh, we do need to address the fact that then the operator has to be uh, looking at a split screen and needs to be paying attention um, uh, to what that video feed is giving them and responding appropriately. Um, so this goes back to um, the presentation of the information and how it gets presented is critical. Um, you've seen this picture before, and so we were able to show that again with a four camera system, uh, you could significantly reduce the blind spots on that very large piece of machinery, and you could also increase uh, the ability to see a standing pedestrian uh, most of the way around um, that machinery. Uh, when we add a camera into the forklift uh, pick, or, uh, video that you already saw, so this is uh, mounted on the very top of the lift truck, uh, and now you can see, uh, you get a little bit of perspective, you can just see the barrel, but you can also see quite a bit of the ground uh, in front of you. And we can test numerous uh, locations for cameras uh, using this particular uh, simulation uh, program. Another uh, testing uh, bed that we have been developing uh, includes uh, this virtual reality uh, platform. Uh, so you can see at the top there, we've got a, an Oculus Rift headset. We've got um, fairly realistic hand and foot input now. Um, and so the bottom picture shows the user's perspective of driving an LHD in an underground uh, mine. And because we are developing this uh, in our own lab, we can customize uh, some of the things uh, that we test and some of the things that the user experiences. Um, and so on the very bottom of that screen, um, can you see my mouse? Oh, it's, it's a bit of a lag. Okay, so on the very bottom, um, you can just see uh, basically what represents a camera feed uh, or a, a proximity detection uh, system, some sort of uh, device uh, that uh, is supposed to be aiding the operator to drive that machine. So um, right now it's just providing a camera view. However, because this is custom software, we could add all sorts of uh, text options. We could test icons in there. Uh, we could test a whole variety of these uh, ergonomic uh, issues around proximity uh, detection. <clears throat> so that's uh, future research uh, coming up. Now, I think I've got one final thing to talk about here, and that is that uh, uh, a lot of the, the work to try and define how these systems get integrated is being done by the Earth Moving Equipment Safety Roundtable um, out of Australia. And they have a huge buy-in from uh, quite a few of the mining uh, manufacturers, at least. I don't know that there's any uh, comparable um, group specifically for construction work, but some of that uh, machinery would still fall into that uh, umbrella. Um, and you can see that they have uh, got different definitions here. So uh, technologies that provide information to enhance the operator's ability to observe and understand the potential hazards in the vicinity of the machine. They've labeled that as their operator awareness. 
Um, we've got level eight, which is uh, advisory control. So the technology then provides some sort of alarm um, or instruction to enhance the operator's ability to predict uh, an unsafe interaction. And the level nine, which I was referring to as collision avoidance type of technology, um, these are technologies that automatically intervene and take some sort of machine control to prevent uh, an accident from happening. So I'd encourage you to uh, check out uh, the work uh, done by that group. Uh, there's a, quite a bit of um, resources there to help with uh, integration of this technology. Uh, so there's my thank you slide. Uh, lots of uh, great work with my research partners and the students working on this, uh, this work. And uh, for more information, you can always uh, check www.crosh.ca. And I think that Caleb wants me to promote next month's webinar. Perfect. So um, yes, this wraps up uh, the formal um, portion of our, uh, of our presentation. Um, if you, there are any questions, um, I will go back in just a moment to um, Dr. Godwin's contact information, or I'm not sure. Uh, either way, you can reach out to uh, her through uh, our website or by email, or you can reach out to myself as well. But I'll just have this up to promote the next upcoming uh, webinar. It will be done by Dr. Ann Pegarero in the School of Human Kinetics. I should be talking about digital media and uh, knowledge transfer. So how do we, how are we packaging uh, occupational health and safety messaging and how is that being communicated uh, as it relates to our, our day and age of uh, digital media. So I'll have that, have that for you there. Um, the links to register will be sent out by email um, or you can get it uh, from our website, crosh.ca. So. Pause that. So, um, Dr. Godwin, if you have time, there's one question from that says, "Has there any consideration been given to it looking at broad broadband backup alarms?" So sometimes they make claim of better direction detection, less annoyance. Yeah. So the a lot of the the work uh, on broadband technology, the uh, group in out of Quebec has done quite a bit of research there. Um, and yes, they seem to be tolerated better uh, by users um, and operators, but specifically for the people working around the machinery. Uh, and I think we even had some grad students uh, in a workplace that had those broadband alarms uh, implemented, and so they were sort of warned that it would, you know, it would, it would feel uncomfortable. They wouldn't want to be behind the machinery, and I don't, I don't know uh, what their experience was 